Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance and its object-oriented implementation. And in this session, I like to start talking about the calibration of our discrete forward rate term structure model. So recall that our model is maybe more or less a model framework. And when I like to talk about calibration, so calibration is how do we determine the three parameters, then maybe I like to go back to this initial version, this initial specification of our model, where we had uh, some uh, correlation parameter, instantaneous correlation for the Brownian drivers. So we have here the Brownian motion, uh, and there is a correlation between these guys, an instantaneous correlation. And we had um, a local volatility function here um, in front. And of course, another uh, model parameter is the initial value, but that's maybe an easier part. Um, so because thinking of volatility and correlation is maybe a bit more intuitive, uh, if we try to understand how these parameters act on the model, but recall that we had also this alternative representation where we fused volatility and correlation into these uh, factor loading parameters, which now stand in front here of an independent uh, Brownian increment. Uh, so we had here the Brownian motion is some linear combination of the independent Brownian motions. Uh, and of course, there's also the volatility parameter somewhere here. Yeah? So there's the volatility parameter and the correlation parameter still hidden in this parameter lambda. But if I like to discuss correlation, maybe I like to view here this model specification as my model. Yeah? Uh, we know the relation between the two and we have also the numerical methods to convert a correlation matrix into the factor loadings. So let's start talking about calibration. And before we look at the parameters, let's start with um, a small uh, remark. So this is my um, agenda. So maybe today we talk about initial conditions and volatilities and also have some nice um, experiments and then correlations will be in a separate uh, session. Okay, as I mentioned, I like to um, view the model in this uh, volatility correlation specification. So my three parameters here are the initial value, the volatility functions, and the correlation functions. So these were functions of time or for volatility, we also specified of time and state. Uh, we could also have a stochastic volatility. So actually a very rich, set um, and also many parameters. Yeah? So if you think that here the N is your time discretization of the interest rate curve, yeah, you have maybe 40 yeah, or 50 uh, years and you take just a very coarse semi-annual discretization, then you already have 80 or 100 uh, forward rates. So you have 100 uh, initial conditions, you have 100 of these functions and you have 100 squared, actually 100 squared half and well, it's 100 times 49 because the diagonal is one of the correlation matrix, um, correlation parameters. Yeah, but anyway, you have many um, parameters and the determination of these parameters. So how do we choose the param these parameters? This is called the calibration of the model. Yeah, and let me do maybe a more uh, general remark. Uh, so when you think of calibration, actually there are maybe two different, uh, maybe two orthogonal uh, approaches. So a first approach that 
is that we could choose the parameters in a way such that the model will reproduce current market prices. So maybe that's one option. So maybe for the initial value, it's already clear how we do this. Yeah? The initial values is the forward rates. So if we calculate the forward rates from zero copper bond prices we observe on the market and we choose these as initial values, then the valuation of such a zero copper bond will be consistent with our observations. So parameters are chosen such that if we value a financial product through the model, so within the model, then this gives an observed market price. Yeah, for volatility, okay, so that maybe means that you observe an option and you know that there's Black-Scholes formula. If you observe an option price, you can invert this and calculate the volatility parameter that you should use to reproduce the observed price. So for um, volatility, that's maybe uh, just uh, implied by an observation of an option price. Uh, recall we had the black model, you know, which was very similar to one special case of our time structure model, the black model for caplet. So we can calibrate maybe the model to an observation of a caplet. However, for volatility, so volatility is how strong is the movement of the forward rates. You can also think of an alternative approach and uh, just observe how strong was the movement in the past. Yeah? You just go to the time series of forward rates you have observed in the past and you just estimate the variance, the standard deviation of the changes of this uh, that you observe in this time series. Yeah? If it is a log normal model, it's the log changes, yeah? um, so the changes of the logarithm, but you can um, find maybe a link between the observe, observed time series and the parameter uh, you choose. So that is then a historical estimation. So, that makes maybe sense for, for a volatility parameter. So the parameters are estimated from historical data. Yeah, for example, a time series of interest rates we observed. Um, and it's not directly clear that the two approaches will give me the same result for the parameter. So which of the two approaches should we use? Yeah, maybe a bit surprising. The second approach is maybe not meaningful. Yeah, maybe not the correct approach. It's maybe not consistent with our application. So historical estimation is maybe not consistent with our application. Okay, so what's what's the problem? So if a parameter of our model is associated with a financial product then you have to think of what is here our application. So our application is the valuation of financial products. And what does valuation mean? Okay, so we have written our model under the equivalent martingale measure. And the reason that we did this is that we have a specific application in mind, na namely the valuation, where valuation means that we like to determine the cost of replicating the financial derivative. Okay, so we have replication uh, in mind, uh, or a different word for that is that we would like to perform hedging, the hedging of the risk. And we like to determine the value of a replication portfolio. 
So we have to set up a replication portfolio and this replication portfolio has to be set up from traded products, traded on the market, traded at current market prices. And now comes the crucial point. If your replication strategy requires that you buy a certain financial product, then if the model is not producing the correct value for the replication portfolio that is consistent with the value of the product that you have observed on the market, then the model does not represent the value that allows you to buy the financial product that you need for the replication strategy. Okay, so that means if you use a financial product as part of your hedging or your replication strategy, then if the model should represent the value of this replication portfolio, then the model has to reproduce the market price in order to allow you to have the correct amount to buy this, this financial product. Or negatively, in other words, if the model did not replicate the current market price, then it would not be possible to buy the replication portfolio of the derivative uh, for which we calculate the model price. Okay, so there is a consistency condition. Uh, however, that consistency condition applies if we use the financial product as part of the replication. So think of my example with the volatility and the caplet. If we use caplets, so if we trade in caplets as part of our replication, for example, we have a complex derivative, which we like to replicate, and we use here this complex model, and we use caplets as part of our replication strategy, then our model should be calibrated to the observed caplet market price. Uh, it could also be that caplets are not available on the market, so the option is not available on the market, and our replication strategy is a replication strategy in, say, swaps, just using swaps, where we like to replicate the caplet. Okay, then we do not observe the parameter to calibrate the model to. Uh, in fact, we use the model to replicate an unobserved financial product. So in that case, what is then the strategy to calibrate my volatility? In that case, the historical estimate is the right approach. Yeah? Maybe you can add some conservative thing to it because your historical estimate could be wrong. But uh, if you understand the delta hedge for an option, yeah, where, yeah, where you just uh, hedge in the underlying, I have a session in the other course on, on hedging. Yeah? So maybe if you'd like to recapitulate this, you can check that one. Then you know that the real, the realized volatility is the right uh, parameter. Okay, so it's not so binary, this decision here. Historical estimates are a fallback, namely in the case where, for example, we do not observe the financial product uh, on the market. So we cannot actually even use it for the replication. So it may be difficult yeah, or impossible to derive some parameters from market prices. So reasons, there could be many reasons. Yeah? So maybe there is low liquidity. Yeah? There is none uh, such product on the market or only very few. So the product does not exist, for example. Then it's uh, an option to use the historical estimate. So historical estimation becomes uh, an option. Of course, you should consider then your 
residual risk that you have estimated the parameter wrongly. Yeah, so there is some model risk. Yeah? So the parameter is part of your model. Your model could be wrong and you should uh, check this. Yeah? You can check the valuation with different choice of the parameters and see the impact of choosing a wrong parameter. Another aspect is that here in our model, we have really many parameters. Yeah? So actually for the example I gave you 50 years semi-annual, we have thousands of parameters, even if you, we just consider piecewise constant deterministic functions for the volatility and the correlations. So even if we would observe thousand financial in instruments, it's maybe not a good idea to just calibrate a set of thousand parameters to a thousand uh, financial products. Because in that case, you are a bit exposed to overfitting uh, of the data. So that means um, your model fits any data that you observe, but it's very uh, susceptible to errors in the data. So errors will immediately appear in the parameters. So uh, what we would like to do to prevent this is a parameter reduction. So maybe we like to reduce the number of parameters so such that the model does not fit every data point. Maybe it's just a kind of interpolation of what we observe, some smooth uh, interpolation so that uh, the model is less um, exposed to, to errors in the data. So that means our term structure model is rather a model framework. So we can create many different models by choosing now special forms of our covariance structure. So a very simple covariance structure would be, for example, that you just drop here the time parameter and say, all forward rates have just a constant um, volatility function. And you drop here also the time parameter and say you have just a constant um, correlation function. That it's already one possible reduction. You could also have some kind of polynomial parametrization yeah, here of this function where, for example, all the parameters could be the same independent of the i. Okay, I have some examples uh, later, yeah, but uh, already here as a remark, uh, it's advisable to maybe reduce the number of parameters and then uh, calibrate a reduced parameter model to a larger set of data. So let's start going through uh, how we choose the three parameters for the model. So we start with the initial condition, that's easy. Our initial condition is the forward rate. And we know how to calculate a forward rate from, for example, observed market prices of zero copper bond. So if we have here a zero copper bond, so this is a market observed zero copper bond. So a bond that matures in TI and pays you one unit of currency. Uh, well, a small remark, usually you do not observe a zero Cooper bond, you observe, uh, for example, swaps uh, or other objects, yeah? um, fast forward rate agreements, and then you can calculate these zero Cooper bond prices from the observed swap prices, yeah? because you remember that when we started introducing interest rates, Everything could be expressed in terms of zero copper bonds. So everything that we derived there, the floater, the swap, and so on. And of course, you can invert this relation to get the corresponding zero copper bonds. So sometimes calibration uh, consists of different steps of transforming the observed variable to, say, more easy objects. Here are the zero copper bonds. And then determine your model parameters from these objects. So this here is just the definition of the forward rate, the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period divided by the bond at the end of the period but by, by the period length. So this is just the definition of the forward rate. 
we observe the forward rate on the market. So this is now the market observed forward rate. And we use this market observed forward rate as the initial condition of our model. Then the model will reproduce the zero copper bond prices, the given market prices. Okay, why is that? Because that was the condition we used for the derivation of the drift. So we know how to, to value a zero copper bond in the model. So in the model, so maybe I know right here, model, the zero copper bond that matures in TI, say observed at T zero, well, that's just the numerator in zero times the expectation under my measure of one divided by the numerator in TI. The numerator is in terms of our model primitive uh, variables, the stochastic process, and the drift was chosen such that this here gives the zero copper bond price. So the model is having the right drift and all the other parameters do not enter into this. Yeah? So if you change sigma, the drift will change such that this condition is still fulfilled. So initial condition is trivial here. There are other models, for example, short rate models, you know, where the initial condition is not, uh, where the, um, sorry, where the calibration of the interest rate curve is not just an uh, initial condition. Yeah, It's then the parameter, for example, in the drift of a short rate model. But here it's fairly trivial. So interesting part is how do we choose now the volatility parameter, the sigma i. So let's assume that, for example, correlation is, determined, yeah, or let's just not think about correlation here. Just now focus on sigma i, the volatility parameter. So the first thing that you could think of is a caplet. Why? Because you recall that our model is in special versions, the log normal one, the normal one or the displaced log normal one, similar to models for which we know analytic formulas, the black model, the Bachelier model, um, where we already derived how we value a caplet under this model analytically. And you remember that then in this valuation formula, which was, for example, the Peck Scholes formula, there appeared the parameter sigma of the model. So the value of a caplet depends on the parameter sigma of the model. So if I have this dependency, maybe I can choose the parameter sigma such that, so this is somehow the inverse problem, such that it, the model matches, the model valuation matches an observed valuation of this financial product. But note also there are other products like for example, swaptions that also have this dependency and you could maybe also look at swaptions and we will this, do this later. So let's start with how can we choose parameters in the model such that the model reproduce it, uh, reproduces an observed caplet market price. So I'm looking at caplets. So we have for the caplet here, this payoff function. It pays the maximum of the forward rate minus a strike K and zero multiplied with the period length at the end of the period, where the forward rate is fixed here at the beginning of the period in TI, uh, and we have payment at the end of the period TI plus one, so it's natural payment unit. And our model creates this stochastic quantity, um, LTI, TI plus one, TI. And of course, our model creates the numerator at the payment time, TI plus one. So this means I can value this financial product in my model. So um, the value of a caplet, well, on the i's forward rate, we have many different caplets within the model. Valuation, say, um, 
in zero. Okay, so the value of this caplet also depends here on the strike. So maybe I add this here as a parameter. Well, this valuation is just our universal pricing theorem, if you like to say. So our model valuation, so just use the stochastic quantities provided by the model. So the payoff maximum L I T I. So let's use that notation zero Delta T I divided by the numeria. Okay, so I can value this financial product in uh, my model. So now um, calibration means that I observe a caplet on the market. Say I observe here now the value of that specific caplet. So it has the same maturity. So that's the parameter I here. Uh, and it has the same strike. Yeah, I observe this value at time zero, so today. And I would like to calibrate the model. So that means that this should be equal to what my model produces. So this is now the equation I would like to solve. Uh, well, a small remark, like for the um, initial value where we observed uh, zero Cooper bond prices, but we actually would like to have the market observed forward rates because then we can just use the market observed forward rates as the model forward rates, the model initial values. Here, uh, we could observe the market price for um, a caplet, but maybe it's more handy, more useful for the model calibration to observe not the price, to observe the implied volatility. And recall the concept of an implied volatility. We had that as a small remark when we considered the black model for Kaplet. So given a market price, VI, for example, for a Kaplet, and you already know the market observed uh, forward rates. So we know already the forward rate, our initial value, we know all the market observed zero copper bond prices. We know also the strike parameter. Then we can calculate the parameter sigma that we would have to use in the analytic formula to match this market price here. So we can express in that case, the value VI is zero in terms of the implied volatility Sigma I market. Yeah. So this here is using, for example, using a model that allows for an analytic evaluation. For example, black model, yeah, we had the black model, there it is, then the black formula, Black-Scholz formula, or we had the Bachelier model there, it's the Bachelier formula. And we could just use these to calculate the sigma parameter of these models. It's not the sigma parameter maybe of our model to from that uh, market uh, price. So this will result then in different market implied, yeah, market implied because it is from the observed market value volatilities. Okay, so that's um, similar to the step that we had for the initial value. From the market prices of the zero copper bonds, I calculate the market implied or market observed forward rates. And then I can use these market observed forward rates in my model. And here I would like to have a similar step before I perform the calibration. So recall the concept of implied volatility. If you go back to our session on, for example, the black model for a caplet. So that was here. We started with this simple model. Actually, the model is a special version of 
our current term structure model. There was also here the sigma parameter. And we could then derive here this evaluation formula. So that was here our plug formula for the caplet, where a parameter sigma, uh, sigma bar here, a single parameter appeared, which determined the value of the option. The sigma bar squared is the integral uh, one divided by T1, the integral of this sigma squared T. So I could use the inversion of this formula that was here in this session. Yeah, So we can invert this formula and express all values in terms of this parameter sigma bar. So we have a function for every sigma, we get the value of the option and we can invert this formula, the inversion is then calculate, uh, called, the inversion is then called the implied, in this case, black volatility because it's the black, black Schultz formula. So I just want to remind you of this because um, often the calibration works like that, that you have maybe two steps. The market observed price is first converted into some other quantity, like the forward rate, the market observed forward rate, or the market observed implied volatility. And then we ask the question, how do we choose now the model parameter that, such that we match the implied volatility, which is just the same question that we match the market observed price. But sometimes, and you will see this now, um, in terms of this condition, this implied volatility, this question is much easier to answer. So now we ask the question, can we choose the model parameter that such that the model implied black or Bachelier volatility matches the market um, observed implied black or Bachelier volatility. So calibration consists of matching the model values to the market values. Let me go through the simple examples, namely our three special versions of the model, the log normal version, the normal version, and the displaced log normal version. Okay, if you assume a log normal model, so our log normal version, then I know that the volatility function here has a special form. It's sigma i, sigma i superscript L, L maybe now for log normal to distinguish it from the other parameters, times L i d w i. Each forward rate has its own log volatility function, its own function sigma i superscript L. Then I know that this model corresponds to a black model. Maybe it's just a black model under a different measure, but moving to a different equivalent martingale measure doesn't change the value. So I can move to the equivalent martingale measure that we used for the derivation of the analytic formula. I know then that the drift is zero and we can just derive the analytic valuation formula, the Black formula. So there exists an analytic evaluation formula. And I know now the relation of this parameter, this function sigma i of t, and the black model implied volatility. So in the derivation, we move to log coordinates. So the logarithm of L is normal distributed. So you know that the logarithm of L, it was lemma just is some drift and then sigma i l d w i. So the variance of that random variable of the logarithm of L is the integral from zero to t i sigma i l squared dt. So this part here 
is the, if you go back to the uh, 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 derivation, yeah, so just this part here is the variance of the random variable logarithm Li of Ti. And that was the object that entered in my analytic formula. Uh, and then we divided it, it is the integrated instantaneous variance. Yeah? So we divided it by time and we took the square root and called that parameter the black implied black volatility. So we get now the model parameter, the black model implied volatility from our term structure model. So this is the parameter we observe in our model. And that parameter has to match now the market observed value of this implied volatility. So we get finally this constraint here for the calibration. So the black implied volatility we observe in the model has to match the black implied volatility we observe in the market. So the whole calibration procedure just to summarize this now consists of several steps. You observe a value of the caplet on the market. From that, you use the black formula. So the analytic valuation formula, just to convert this observed quantity to an implied volatility parameter. And then you have the condition that this market observed quantity should match the black model implied volatility we observe in the model. So the calibration is now the constraint one hundred twenty two. So this has to match where the model implied volatility is associated with my model parameter. Yeah? So this is now the link to this model parameter. So plus plus number one hundred. 21 gives me, uh, well, it doesn't give me exactly the sigma i of t. It just gives me a condition on sigma i. In our case, we have the special log normal model, sigma i superscript l of t. And that's here the condition. So the integral of this function has to match a certain value. So that would be how we can reproduce caplet market prices. If the integral of our volatility function, now the special case of the log normal model, matches the black implied volatility in this sense, yeah, integral of the squared uh, divided by time is the squared of the black um, model volatility, then the model reproduces the caplet market price. Okay, so you see there is already um, over determination. I have different possibilities to choose this function and still match the same value. One trivial uh, way to choose it would be just to use here a constant. Yeah? So if this parameter goes away, then you see this one divided by ti is just canceling the integral and the square is canceling the square root and it means that if you choose this function here as a constant, then this constant here is the black implied volatility. And that's the reason why this model is in this form so popular. Uh, this model reproduces, of course, the black um, uh, volatility if you just make it a black model and choose this a, a constant. It's just a generalization of this model. Okay, so that's the calibration procedure for the caplet. Put differently, it is a constraint that we have now on the model to reproduce the caplet market prices. Okay, let's go quickly through 
the two other cases, we may also think of the normal version of the model. So the normal version of our term structure model has here just the parameter sigma dw. Let's call it sigma superscript n. Well, then to link it to the black implied volatility is maybe a bit difficult, but it's trivial to link it to the Bachelier volatility because our model just corresponds to a Bachelier model. This is just a Bachelier model. So we have the same trick. We can link now our function here, sigma i to a Bachelier implied volatility. So calculating the Bachelier implied volatility that is created by the model from our model parameter is just calculating the integral of sigma i superscript n squared divided by the time interval taking the square root. So we have the same calibration constraint. So in order to calibrate the normal version to an observed Kaplet market price, the Bachelier implied volatility calculated from the model has to match the Bachelier implied volatility calculated from the observed market price huh? by inversion of the Bachelier formula. So this number 124 is my, my condition such that the model reproduces Kaplet market prices. This normal version reproduces Kaplet market prices. And it's also a condition here on this function on the volatility function. And you have many possibilities to choose this function. If you say that the, the function is a constant, then the sigma n is just the implied volatility. So, and the same thing exists here for the displaced log normal version. So if you have a displaced log normal version, well, there is a displacement parameter. So we have here a displacement. So there is here some D. It's not a log normal model. It's um, a shifted log normal model. So L plus D is log normal, not L. Um, and you have the parameter sigma i here for this log normal variable for L plus D. And you can calculate um, implied displaced log normal volatility by integrating this uh, function. Um, and you can also derive an analytic formula for the displaced model and then get the same constraint that the model quantity has to match the market observed quantity where the market observed quantity is obtained by inverting this analytic formula. So this analytic formula is just an adjusted version of your black schultz formula because it is still a log normal model, but just for a shifted variable. Okay, so that was how we match caplet market prices, but caplet, okay, it's multiple caplets. Actually, it's just a single caplet for a given maturity, right? So we can choose a fixed maturity. So it's a caplet for a fixed maturity TI, and we can choose a fixed strike, say K star, then for this caplet with that maturity and that strike, we observe the market price. We can calculate the implied volatility and we get our condition on the model parameter sigma i, uh, i for this ti here, of t. And that implies then the value for all other caplets that have the same maturity, but different strikes. Okay, so we just observed, we just calibrated to one special strike. So for example, if you choose our sigma as being the constant, 
then this constant is fully determined by observing just this one caplet for the maturity Ti. Of course, we have different forward rates, L1, L2, L3. So we can individually calibrate all the maturities, T1, T3, and so on, you know, with different implied volatilities, sigma one, sigma two. But with respect to the parameter strike in the caplet, so here in the payoff function, the strike K, we just calibrate to a single strike K star and all the other caplets are then implied by our choice, by our model calibration. So there is maybe no further degree of freedom. So this has to be uh, maybe a bit investigated. Um, this function, the function that maps the strike on the implied volatility this is called the volatility smile. For a given strike, I observe for a fixed maturity, so TI is now fixed, and that strike I observe a market price, and then I can invert the analytic formula, Black, Bachelier, whatever you use, to calculate the volatility parameter, and this is, um, called volatility smile. Well, the smile just refers to the fact that you often observe on the financial market that this dependency, where here you have your K and here you have your Sigma looks a little bit like that. Okay, so it looks a little bit like a smile. So the calibration constraint, if we just consider, for, for example, a constant for our sigma i of t, then we just have a single degree of freedom for a given maturity ti, and we can just maybe determine a single, we just can fix a single implied volatility. We can calibrate our model to match this point, but all the other points here are now uh, implied by my model. Of course, you can generalize the model. We already had three different versions, the log normal one, the normal one, the displaced one, and all these three models will create different such volatility smiles. So there is the possibility to calibrate to the volatility smile by choosing our volatility function the local volatility function, especially the dependency on the L, um, in a special way. So this is then the so-called smile calibration. So how do we calibrate the smile? So one may um, also extend the models to other local volatility functions or stochastic volatility or jump diffusion processes. And this is then also creating different volatility smile. I have a nice little um, experiment on the volatility smile uh, at the end of this session. So one other remark. So that was now a remark, fixed maturity TI, look at different strikes. Yeah, so my volatility function, my implied volatility function is a volatility that depends on the maturity and on the strike of the caplet that I observe. So that was now a remark on, look at a fixed maturity for different strikes, you may observe different prices that have different market implied uh, volatilities. Next remark, fixed strike maybe, but different maturities. So this is then I'm running over different maturities, so different times. So this is then a term structure um, of volatilities. So I view now my implied volatility here as a function of time where I have different maturities. And since my model has um, a dedicated volatility function, volatility parameter for each forward rate. 
sigma i of t, I can calibrate to all those maturities, at least the maturities that belong to my tenor discretization, my time discretization of the interest rate curve. And we already had um, a very simple one. So I can fit for a fixed strike, so Ki, so one strike for that maturity, Ti. I can fit my model to a market observed implied volatility by just choosing the parameter sigma i to be constant, yeah, so to be here identically this implied volatility. So that's for all uh, t. Yeah, so just a constant one, and I just have um, fitted uh, the model. But there's also maybe an alternative way. Uh, you can think of having a single function, the same function for all LIs, but the LIs start or see different parts of this function. And this model is also very popular here, is that we have, say, um, a piecewise constant function, can also be a continuous smooth function, sigma bar, where we choose the sigma i of t to be sigma bar of ti minus t. So you see that the time here is parameterized backward. So what does this mean? So if you have, let me draw a small picture. So if you have your time and you have maybe a forward rate that matures here, ti, then you have this volatility function sigma i bar. So maybe that looks like that. So this is the function sigma i, sigma i of t, which is now sigma i bar going backward. Yeah. So for little t equal ti, it's zero. So it goes backward from here. So then if you have a forward rate at a later point. So that was here the point Ti. But now if I have some forward rate at a later point, so maybe I choose this here, Tj, then I have to use the same function for this forward rate. So the same function, the function starts here and it goes down in the same way. But you know that the function is now longer. And if that part here is the blue part. There is now an additional degree of freedom, namely that part here that you could choose to calibrate the additional uh, different implied volatility. Yeah. So there's always a piece, an additional piece being introduced here at the end of the function, actually at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, if you see this sigma i of t, huh, that gives you uh, an additional degree of freedom. So this way of doing this is sometimes, sometimes called time homogeneous because actually all the forward rates get the same volatility function in terms of this parameter here. And this parameter is the time to maturity the remaining time to maturity. Well, is this possible? Uh, well, it may be that actually this is here not solvable. It could be that the stuff under the square root is uh, negative. So what does this mean? Okay, so it means that um, actually the integral over the part that you have already determined is larger than the implied volatility that you um, observe. Yeah, So that guy here is larger than the implied volatility that I observe. Of course, then I cannot choose here this part. Uh, so the smallest thing that this part can have is zero. So then I cannot choose this part here to match the uh, remaining remaining stuff. But if that is not the case, yeah, then you can um, 
calibrate here this functions and we have a single function for all forward rates independent of i to uh, calibrate a time term structure at time a set of um, caplets with different maturities well going back to the previous remark the fact that actually the model has an easy way to calibrate an observed caplet by just choosing a constant here well this is maybe one reason for the initial popularity um, of the model. Huh? So caplet calibration is also easy as long as you calculate the implied caplet volatility and as long as you use one of the special versions of the model. Okay, so let's conclude with a few numerical experiments on the um, caplet implied volatility and the relation to our model parameters. And uh, really here, uh, experimenting now with the model that we have implemented in the computer gives you really a great intuition yeah, for what's going on. And that's really important uh, also to say develop better models and then also develop better calibrations to, to market observed values. And also the experiment maybe explains a little bit here this volatility smile thing. Okay, so what I would like to um, explore is the impact of the displacement parameter D or say equivalently the blending parameter alpha in our model on the caplet market prices. So this is nice because if you write down the model with this blending parameter, so here I have the parameter alpha, so my blending, so a mixture of the two models. So if I write, if I use that, Okay, here I use alpha i, it's a dedicated parameter for every model, but I just consider now a single maturity. Okay, then the model local volatility function is alpha i times l i zero, l i zero is a constant. So this is just an initial value here. So this is a constant plus one minus alpha i l i of t. So you see that this model is an interpolation of a log normal model. So the log normal model is the case when you just have alpha to zero and you just have the part Li, sigma IDW, and a normal model, which is the case alpha equals one, because then the Li part is zero, then I just have here the constant part. And you see this is actually the same as the displaced model, where I just have a rewriting of the displacement. Yeah? So it, you can also write this as sigma, this here is the sigma, times L plus some D. Okay, so let's have an experiment with this because it nicely uh, uh, combines the th three different versions uh, we had before, the log normal one, the normal one, and the displaced one, which is where the alpha is in between zero and one. So I use some parameters. I have a fixed volatility sigma, so sigma is a constant. Uh, I have a fixed flat initial value, Li is 5% for all the i's. I consider just a single maturity caplet. We will take here t equals five. And then I would like to look at this implied volatility smile. So the implied volatility function for different strikes. So k should range from 
0.025. So this is half of the initial forward rate to 0 0.10. This is double the initial forward rate. So actually the, the um, case where you choose K equal to the initial value, this is called the add the money caplet. So this is called add the money where the strike equals the forward. So then convert the caplet price back to the implied volatility. So that's now the exercise that I would like to do. I would like to convert. So I would like to calculate in these different models, the caplet price. And then I would like to calculate the plaque implied volatility. So if I would do this for the log normal model, then in theory, so the following should happen. I have a log normal model with sigma parameter 30%. I value a caplet in this model. I then calculate the implied volatility using the log normal model assumption. So using exactly the model which I used to calculate the value. So I would like to see that then I get as an output the 30%. Okay, because then I just calculate the parameter in my model. So if alpha is zero, so I have a log normal model, so I have a black mo model. So I'm in theory at least calculating with this procedure, just sigma i. So, and the sigma i should be independent of k. So actually I do not see a smile, I see a constant line, a constant line that is around the 30%. So that's what I expect. The nice question is now, what do we see if we change the model parameter? Yeah, but we are still calculating under the assumption of um, a black log normal model. So this is the code. Um, let me just um, explain you a little bit the code. Let's go here to our little experiment. Yeah, you remember we already had here this experiment. I used this in the previous session. So we had this little model factory that allows us to create our term structure model using different parameters. And there was here the volatility parameter and there was here this blending parameter. So this here is our sigma, this is our alpha. So we walked through this code of how we create the model in one of the previous sessions. Yeah, so, so you remember this, create the forward rate curve, create maybe the discount curve, create the time discretization, create the volatility function, the correlation function and create the model. So that is already known. And we did some experiments. You remember here with the bond and the forward rate. Okay, so if I run this now here, um, then it will just produce the graphs that we had in the script. The first one was the error of the bond valuation without and with the control variant, and then the approximation error of the forward rate under spot measure and terminal measure. Yeah, so you remember these. Um, So you can, you can check the code here again of this experiment here in these uh, repositories in this class. Yeah? So this is the class I'm now looking at. And I prepared here two other experiments. So to make it a bit shorter, I do not want to code it live. Yeah, I could code it live. It's not so, so big, the code. Um, and I would like to discuss this with you. Um, Let's have a look at, say, the first um, example, the one with the caplet smile. So that goes here. So what do we do? We just set a few 
fixed parameter. So we start with a model that has a constant forward rate, 5%, semi-annual time discretization. Yeah, so period length is one half year. Uh, we do not use this um, control variate that we had discussed. Our volatility parameter is fixed 60%. And I would like to use in the first part, just the log normal model. So this alpha is zero. So I have zero times Li zero. So that goes away. One minus alpha, so one Li sigma IW. So it's a log normal model. Um, correlation doesn't interest us uh, at the moment. So correlation decay parameter is, zero, uh, is one. So that means all forward rates have the same are perfectly correlated. And we use our little factory cre to create this Monte Carlo simulation. So now let's value different products. And you see the code is quite short. Yeah, so what I'm doing here, I create a loop for different strikes. So my strike range should go from 2.5% to 10%. So the range that we have on the slide, I create the caplet valuation code, the caplet valuation code. Okay, we can have a peek into this. It's just very shortly. The payoff function, the forward rate minus the strike, take the maximum of that and zero. Okay, multiplied with the period length. Okay, that's the caplet. There's also the floorlet. And then you divide by the numeria and take the expectation. So there's not, nothing special in it. Yeah, it's just a, a very short, very short code. That's the caplet valuation code. And we call this function using our model. So now comes the part that we have the value, the price of our caplet from our model. And I like to calculate now the implied volatility using the analytic Black-Scholes formula. So you see there is here an analytic Black-Scholes formula. Well, implied volatility function. So if you peek into this here, you see that it is just um, a numerical root finder. Here it's Newton's method that is constantly calculating Black Schultz formula, that's Black Schultz formula here, and choosing the volatility. So the volatility is the one parameter that has changed to match the given price. So the option value is here given and we, we value here the option value and like to matches. So we have some function here that can calculate out of, uh, maybe I make this a bit larger here, so you see what's going on here. Out of a given option value, it can calculate the volatility parameter I should use in Black-Scholes formula to match this price. So we have the value calculated from our model. So that's here the value calculated from our numerical model. And I pass that here in the formula. So actually this here is just, use this code, yeah? you could just write the arguments in the function directly, but it's just the names that are used by the function. Yeah? The function expects here parameter forward, option maturity, option strike, pay of unit and option value. And these are just here the parameters. So we have a bit more code here. So the forward is just the forward rate of my model. Well, I could use now here actually this constant for that, but everything I do here is based on the numerical model. So everything here is based on my model. So maybe I should call this here my term structure simulation. Okay, and you see that I use this numerical model to calculate the value of the caplet, but I also use it here to calculate the value of the zero copper bond price. And I use it here to calculate the value 
of the forward rate. Yeah? So we had forward rate and zero cobalt bond in pre uh, the previous session. So I also used the numerical model uh, to do that. So I'm completely independent of which model I use. Uh, if you would have a model that creates different values for that, yeah, I would consistently do uh, the calculation here of the corresponding implied volatility with the model um, values. Um, yeah, option maturity is clear, strike is clear, payoff unit is the zero copper bond times the period length, yeah, because the caplet pays L maximum of L minus K and zero times the period length. Yeah, so don't forget that. That has to go in and then the option value and I calculate the implied wall. So let's run the, this program. So maybe I disable the old experiments before we run this. So let's run now this program. So, and I get here this caplet implied volatility. So you see that I do that actually here for both measures. And you see, yeah, terminal measure and spot measure they are not 100% identically. Yeah? Here, for example, it appears as if it is a little bit larger, yeah? but here it's smaller. So there is a smaller error here, a smaller error here. So we would expect a horizontal line. So in theory, we should get exactly the value 30 percent because we are calculating the implied volatility using the log normal analytic formula from a log normal model so we should actually get the 30 percent but we don't get the 30 percent though there are errors here and these are due to numerical errors well, we have a Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah? So if you think of our Monte Carlo simulation, okay. then here there is the maturity TI. Here I plot maybe the variable LI and my Monte Carlo simulation now creates here this log normal distribution. And if you have now a caplet with, say, a very high strike, so K is large, then this means here you have K at a very high value, and you are now valuing the option that pays maximum of L minus K and zero. And you see there are only very few Monte Carlo sample paths going into the, this uh, region. Yeah? So you have only very few Monte Carlo sample paths in this region. So you have maybe a large numerical error. So that's why we observe this uh, behavior. And the same we have here, but the spot measure appears to be a little bit better for the larger values, but a little bit worse for the smaller values. Okay, why is that? The spot measure drift is positive. So it pu it's pushing more Monte Carlo sample paths to the larger values. The terminal measure drift is negative. So it has less Monte Carlo sample paths in this area. So here we have a smaller error. We have more sample paths here. Since the drift is positive and pushing sample path into this region. So now let's make the second exercise and change the parameter of this volatility blending. So I created here the same test as a copy again. So let me enable that. Caplet smiles. So actually there was no smile. There was a flat implied volatility. And now I also have a loop 
over all parameters d. Yeah, so you do see, I do not have the loop over the different measures. Yeah, I just use here the spot measure. There's not such a big difference. So I um, have now different parameters alpha here. So if you go to the script, in the script you find the code here. And here I have the parameter, the parameter alpha that runs from zero, which is the log normal model to one, which is the normal model. And we run in 10, 10, different, 10 different models. And apart from that, the other code is still the same. Let's run this program and check what is happening. Okay, so that took a while, but now we see 10 different curves for the 10 different implied volatilities. Okay, and let's, let's try if we understand what's going on here. So the red curve is the one that we were calculating before. And you see, there is this uh, issue that we have some numerical error. So this is the curve for alpha equals zero. It's the log normal model. But apart from the numerical error, it's the horizontal line. Then these black ones here are the one where alpha is between zero and one. And the green one is alpha equals to one. So it is the normal model. And you see that I suddenly get this shape. You see that at the point, at the money point, so here at 5%, all the model roughly reproduce the correct implied volatility of 30%. But on the outside now, the behavior is a bit different. And why is the behavior on the outside a bit different? So let's have a look at the normal model. So we have DLI is some drift plus sigma i DWI. Okay, and this is not um, a log normal model. The log normal model would be sigma i li dwi. So you could think of this being sigma i one divided by li li dwi. Okay, so I did not I did not do anything wrong. But now the coefficient here, if this would be a constant, it would be the implied volatility that we calculate here. And now you see that our normal model is like a log normal model where the volatility parameter is becoming stochastic. Yeah? So this parameter, depends on Li. And what you also see is, if the interest rate becomes smaller, the volatility becomes larger. So you see that an, a, a normal model or going more to a normal model is like transforming a log normal model in the way that for smaller interest rates, we have larger log normal volatility parameter. And that's the reason why we suddenly see this effect that the implied volatility which we calculate here rises and the implied volatility which we calculate here drops down. Yeah? It's because we actually have this um, effect. Well, we are, we are valuing an option and if you think of the picture that we previously had, so there is here maturity, and here we have our distribution. If you value an option, that means 
the relevant point is the point where you have this kink here because all linear functions don't care about the variance. The relevant point is where you have this kink. And this kink is exactly the strike. So this point here is the strike. So changing the strike and calculating the implied volatility will give me some information about the distribution of the forward rate in this region. And from this picture here, I know that in the region of low interest rates, so in the region of low strikes, the model locally looks like a model with a large volatility. So I believe that was a nice uh, experiment to see how changing this model property, log normal, normal, uh, affects here the option prices. Well, a last remark, option prices, we were looking here at option prices in terms of implied volatility. The reason is that this is actually like, uh, it's a little bit like um, a lacmus test. Yeah, it, it makes the effect visible. And to conclude here, what would happen if we look at this, if this would not be the implied volatility, if it would be just the value, the price. So we can just do this here in our small experiment. So I make this just brutally here as a modification. So you see, I'm plotting here the implied volatility curves and the implied volatility curves are the strikes and the implied volatilities. So this here is the vector of the implied volatilities. And now I put here instead the implied volatility, let's put here the value inside. So this will now plot the value. And to make the graph a bit nicer, let's change here and write here value. And I also have to remove this fixing of the vertical axis and let's run that uh, experiment now. So now you will calculate different caplet values for different strikes and also for different blending parameters alpha and he will plot the value and not the implied uh, volatility. And I get this picture and you see that well, the value of an option is a decreasing function in the strike. Yeah? And this effect that the value of the option is decreasing in the strike is so strong that you maybe see not the difference of the different models. So calculating the implied volatility, which is a constant as a function of the strike, if it is a log normal model, the implied log normal model volatility, you can also make this exercise the other way around with the Bachelier volatility and then plot the smile in terms of Bachelier. Yeah, that doesn't matter. But now visualizing the value in terms of the implied volatility gives you a better resolution on this effect. And that's maybe a nice concluding remark that looking at model prices in terms of these implied parameters is a very good tool to get an intuition of what's going on. That was it for today. Thanks.